in accordance and you know, if you vote for the support for things that we believe um, and frankly have sworn to uphold um, or have pledged, you know, by party affiliation to be supportive of or not. And so it's just a really useful way because frankly, there's a lot of legislation going through the New Hampshire House at all times, so it's hard to stay abreast of things and when you're just reading a title and a blurb sometimes you have no idea what's actually inside the legislation. Um, what it actually does. So anyway, so that's how I got to know Beth really well, and I appreciate all his work on that committee. Um, by way of further introduction, um, so I'm from Salem, New Hampshire, so right there at the bottom of the state border in Massachusetts, and I'm serving my fourth term currently in the state legislature. And I, right now on the finance committee, I was there last term as well, so I have the joy of putting together the state budget um, and, you know, during my time there, I found that New Hampshire is very unique, frankly, among states in that we're very citizen-minded in terms of being a legislature. And frankly, as elected officials, we should be all about public service. It should be an aspiration to serve. It shouldn't be an ambition for a career of politics, in my opinion. And I think the New Hampshire legislature is exemplary of that. Um, and so that's been my way of serving in my life. I um, was born in Boston. My mother is an Italian immigrant. Uh, she came here with her family for economic opportunity, um, as is, of course, you know, the immigrant story in so many cases. My father's from the Southwest. Um, they met in Boston in school. I was born there, and then my family moved to Salem, New Hampshire when I was about five, and I've been there ever since. Um, despite um, spending time back in Massachusetts um, during college and graduate school. But um, my brother's also a serviceman. He's in the Air Force. He's a captain and um, will likely be deployed to Afghanistan actually this October in his capacity. He's a doctor as well. So um, that's what he would be serving um, over there. So in my time in the legislature, I've been very mindful of, you know, I love our state. I think, you know, we have the, just the quality of living is amazing. We always turn out at the top of the list on quality of life indicators, which is wonderful. Um, level of education and educational opportunity, um, business friendliness in some ways, not in others that we've been working on, um, and in many other indicators. And But I've been very much in tune with or concerned, I guess you could say, about what are our long-term prospects um, as one state in this union, in this country. And so I think that you know, long-term economic development is something that we should always be mindful of in our state. And to that end, I've been very much involved legislatively working um, to, of course, um, to help, um, up, frankly, allow the New Hampshire economy to develop uh, in the innovation economy. I've worked very closely with them, also the high-tech industry, and particularly in the healthcare sector, the specialty sector. Um, I think you know innovation, science, education, and, um, and all of those industries, they're very closely linked. And that's one area where, through regulatory reform, towards business friendly and um, tax friendly and, uh, excuse me, opposed tax, but in other words, friendly to people, friendly to their investments and their pocketbooks and their uh, maintaining, you know, the money they earn. I've been working to make sure that we're able to be prosperous in the long term and develop in ways that also help solve our brain drain problem, which we have at the state as well. So that's something I've, I've been, um, very much involved in in my time there. And so what I've found, and the reason that I'm now running for the US Congress, is um, particularly, as I said, through my work in the healthcare area, I've been trying to find reforms that make that system, which leaves much to be desired, you know, a number of years ago, and now leaves even more to be desired, but to make it more consumer-oriented, to be tying quality and the dollar value of healthcare together, um, and that is something that's very opaque right now. It's not transparent at all. So I've been working on pricing transparency and then also, again, allowing people to take that investment, uh, take that risk, try to develop and innovate in the specialty sector wherein 
um, especially in, in my uh, district in Salem, there are all of these ambulatory surgical centers and uh, very consumer-oriented, community-engaged types of facilities that do very uh, specialized work in uh, unique areas and of healthcare that, frankly, people need and is transparent and is something they can say, this is what I need. I want to find this service, find out how much I need to pay for it if, for example, I'm uninsured or paying out of pocket, and then are able to find and access those services. So that's something that I, I've been very passionate about. And my frustration is that despite all the good work that elected officials, uh, such as myself and my colleagues that have been working in those areas, and those working in those industries to, again, uh, innovate and offer those services. What I find is that our federal government, especially the perfect example of this being the ACA, Obamacare, is that they're, as usual, sending a mandate down the pipeline, treating New Hampshire with its own particular health care environment and ecosystem, and treating it the same as though, you know, we have the same issues as California, as though Wisconsin and Vermont, and have the same populations, the same challenges. That is not true, and anything that is broad-based, or excuse me, I should say, broadly applied um, across the board, it never allows for those that are trying to solve the problems, trying to escape whatever that challenge is and trying to make things better, it ends up reducing everything to the lowest common denominator and not allowing our state, for example, if we're working on a particular area that we have a problem with, we should be able to solve that ourselves and not have to deal with the federal government coming in and wreaking havoc on the entire ecosystem. So of course we've seen, I mean, in our state, it's been a mess. We have, I was talking to a gentleman the other day, um, his five children, and they have been going to this hospital, to a particular doctor, for close to two decades, because he has, you know, a span of age range as well. They have a particular um, need, you know, an issue that they need to go in um, routinely for. He can't go there anymore. He can't see his doctor anymore. The family cannot. That's a mess. I know there are people up in the North Country. Now they have to travel more than three hours to go to a hospital, one of the 10 to 12 that are now, of our 26 hospitals that are out of network. This is not health care reform. You know? This is a, a mess, really, is what it is. Um, so I would be committed. I think my, my basic responsibility, if I were in U.S. Congress, were to be elected to that honor, um, would be to be voting in such a way that prevents the federal government from being an obstacle to the uh, success and problem solvings and development of this state. I'd be looking to put power back in the hands of New Hampshire citizens, allow them to create the consumer-oriented environment in every industry, and allow for people to feel as though their investment in hard work and innovation would not only pay dividends for themselves, but also for society, because that's, in fact, what happens. When people get out there with their creative ideas and start companies, get involved in the community, um, are free to take risks, invest in whatever it is they want to, be it their time, their energy, or their resources, that's when everybody benefits. And so that's what I would be looking to support instead of what we've seen with our current representation in Representative Custer, um, where just today on NHPR, she said that she considers herself one of the strongest supporters of President Obama in the entire U.S. Congress. That was a quote from her. Um, and she also said that had she been there um, when the ACA was voted into place, she would have supported it as well. That was her today. She's completely unashamed. She obviously doesn't care, you know, about what has happened to the state and the people in the state and the challenges they're now facing. And I think that's terrible. And of course, you know, as a member of Congress, she doesn't have to deal with the ramifications of Obamacare herself because she has the health care provided by virtue of her office. Um, that's not something that should be occurring in this country. It's not something that we should accept from our representation in Congress, and I would seek 
to provide a very strong contrast to that, and again, be voted in such a way to allow the federal government, or to not allow the federal government to be an obstacle to New Hampshire's development. So that is uh, my story, and um, I would just like to say that, you know, as it's my fourth term in the state legislature, so again, going on eight years, I've had a lot of time to work with so many colleagues from across um, the spectrum of Republicans within our party. And I know that a lot of uh, the challenges we have are self-inflicted in some ways in that a lot of times, you know, we have a lot of infighting and, you know, people that are loyal to this group or this person or this candidate in the past that they bring that with them, you know, through every election. And I really, I always try to lead with what is an idea, what is a solution, what is a policy I'm trying to promote, what is a principle I'm trying to uphold, and then I'll work with anybody, honestly, you know, because I think we all do have many shared values in so many ways. But that doesn't mean that I have to abandon my principles. It doesn't mean I have to compromise on my core beliefs and what I've sworn to uphold and protect. And um, to that end, I've also done that, you know, in recent elections and whatnot. You know, I think um, I think that it's really important that you tell people what it is you support and why, to the best of your ability. And then the expectation, I think, you know, for my conscience, and then of course for the security of that vote that was entrusted to me, that I then keep that promise when in office. It's the easiest and cleanest way to go about things. And you know what? If people then decide they don't like that, then that's why they can vote you out. But I don't need to spend my time saying one thing and doing another and trying to equivocate and qualify and all of that. So that's the way I try to go about it. I've done that uh, in my time in the legislature, and I would intend to do that as well in this Congress. So with that, I thank you for having me. I would obviously love to earn all of your support. Um, I have a sign-up sheet over there, some information. I have a website where I have um, different clips and um, <clears throat> news and press bits, and then also policy positions, so you can read what I actually support on a variety of issues. I think that's important. And um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, and thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was say, frankly, I'm a little disappointed because I didn't hear the words debt or deficit used once in your presentation. And I have a very strong feeling, belief, that that's the biggest obstacle that we face as a country. Uh, if we don't get that under control, uh, I, thought, uh, I was fortunate to attend Senator Ayotte's presentation in Claremont yesterday, and she did a good job of laying out, you know, the consequences of what's going to happen mm -hmm. if we don't get our arms around that. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you'd talk a little bit about what your sure. feeling is on that. Absolutely, and I apologize for the uh, my stump speech is still <laughs> in progress. No. Um, no, that's obviously a most serious issue. But again, you know, of all the basic responsibilities one would have, you need to be thinking, you know, what are you doing, again, to empower people in your state to live as personally responsible, individually, uh, uh, individual liberty, all of these things that we, we want to support and allow Americans to enjoy in this exceptional land. But the fact of the matter is when we're at 17 to $18 trillion in debt, we don't actually know if any of that will be around because you know our state is not an island in and of itself. We're obviously connected um, with the entire rest of the country. So the other most serious thing and important thing I could be doing as a member of Congress is being willing to have a spine and being willing to try in some way. Now, I don't like to make promises I can't keep. So to be honest, I don't know if it's the process that's a mess. You know, I've been fortunate to be able to work on the state budget in New Hampshire. So I know that we have to balance our budget and we go through it item by item. You know, I go through the different agencies, we ask questions, we find out was this efficient, you know, was this a good use of taxpayer resources, what are the outcomes, you know, for this program or that one. And frankly, it seems to me that the process in Washington is a disaster as well. And in many ways, I'm sure that's very limiting, you know, when it comes to fixing some of 
what are you know the long-standing problems we have. So I would love to get in there and tackle that. I don't actually know how exactly I'll be able to do that on that level. The other thing is, of course, you know, when it comes to entitlement reform, when it comes to looking at um, these promises, you know, that have been made. And again, this is a federal government that institutes a program, you know, so take Social Security, which is not an entitlement, right? It was supposed to be a trust fund. It was actually first supposed to be voluntary. Well, that didn't last long. Then it was supposed to be, you know, safe, right, from being rated. Then it was moved to a general fund. Then it's rated constantly. I can tell you that people in my generation, I don't think of Social Security and think of it as something that's going to be there for me. I actually assume it won't be and try to make, you know, my life plans assuming that it won't be. That is quite sad. So I have no trouble looking at everything. I think everything should be on the table. We need to be looking at, look, it, you might, I know, again, I've served on the budget committee, so I know that, it's like, well, we have to cut this, we have to, you know, find efficiencies here, we have to do all these things, and nobody wants their bucket touched, and that's the reality. They'll send you there to fix the problem, but then when you try to fix it, they say, anyone, you know, anybody's but mine. Well, that's a big problem. And um, frankly, I think, again, everything should be on the table, and we can't be afraid you know, to make the adjustments that, that are necessary, because at the end of the day, when it all becomes insolvent, nobody will have anything. So that's obviously, that's, that's a big point, right? so, so that's not, you know, there's no point in doing that. And frankly, you know, I'd like to live the American dream myself. You know, I'd love that for my children. And uh, we should be able to rely on a government that's providing what should be its basic responsibilities. That's you know fulfilling the rule of law, providing for basic infrastructure, and keeping us safe, and protecting private property rights. I mean, these are these are what the government should be doing, and it's gone far, far astray. So, hope that helps. And I'll try to talk about that more. <laughs> well, it is it is a very complex issue, and. Uh, you know, Senator Ayotte pointed out yesterday, 65 percent of our budget uh, that Congress has no control over. It's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, interest on the debt, mm -hmm. which if it, interest rates got up to where they should be, uh, would would be we be we could be looking at close to a trillion dollars a year in, right. in interest payments. Right. Well, also, and then look at you know some of the things. So, for example. When looking of areas to cut, right, and again, looking at what actually the role of government is and what it should be doing. Look, the military is something that we want, we want to be the strongest, you know, military. We want people to know that if they mess, us up, mess with us or, you know, threaten us in some way, not only can we protect ourselves, but we can help, you know, our friends and allies worldwide. We shouldn't be policing the world, but we should at least engender their respect you know, knowing that we have that capability and strength. Well, guess what? I don't want to be cutting the military, you know, defense budget just for the sake of cutting it. But, you know, it's a mess, the procurement process. You know how much waste there is in that? I mean, so again, there's where there's a systemic problem. It's ingrained, it's institutionalized. There's so much waste. I don't honestly know, you know, how one goes about fixing that. But if there's a way, I would love to be involved in doing that. And I'll... I consider that my job, you know, if I were to go there to find a way to do that. Um, you know, contracts are renewed, um, things are, you know, handed out to uh, various uh, contracting firms, this, that, and the other, and, you know, expenses aren't actually looked at, efficiencies aren't looked at, and it's, it's just, that's one area, again, where there could be so many savings and we just the system has gotten out of control. So you can imagine in all the other areas um, that it's much of the same. Yes. I have a question. Uh, you know Frank Dodd Law? Yes. Okay. Would you vote that to get rid of it? Yes, absolutely. Frank. That and Sarbanes-Oxley, okay. I believe, have been two of the most, from talking, you know, to, well, let's put it this way. You have big companies, you have small companies. The big companies can afford accountants, lawyers, these people to, you know, say, hey, look, we need to hire a few more of you. We need to task you 
to making sure we're in compliance or not in violation of this new massive federal law that has you know 12 million pages and nobody can frankly understand or parse through. They can handle it. The small companies forget it. Not only do ones that are already started go under because they can't handle the necessary added administrative, uh, legal, and, and um, accounting functions, but those that were going to start in the first place, they won't. They absolutely won't. You know, you can't you can't start a business when you know that you're not going to be able to get through the regulatory hurdles, the compliance issues, um, and the rest. It, it's just not going to happen. So those are two perfect examples um, in the basic, you know, general financial sector where, you know, again, they may seek to do some positive things and maybe you know accomplish a few positive things, but on the whole, anytime you throw out some massive you know, new set of regulations that touches everything and has tentacles into everything, you're get bound to create more problems than once you're solved. Yeah. Thank you for your honesty. When you don't know something, you admit it. Because too many times a politician will walk their way through something <coughs> thinking they're telling you what you want to hear and I can see you're not doing that. Where do you stand on the fair tax? Uh, the fair tax, I think that, I mean, tax reform, again, is another one. It needs to happen. It just <clears throat> needs to happen. It's, again, putting, it's, uh, putting those at a disadvantage, you know, those running their own companies, doing contracts, and all of these things. It's very burdensome. You can be in violation, you know, so many different ways. You try to do your best, and many times I'm sure a lot of people just throw their hands up in the air and say, you know what, I tried, or you know what, I'm not even going to, you know, try to expand my company or, you know, do whatever it is that they want to do. Whereas those that have the means, you know, those that can afford to hire an accountant or those that, you know, have them on staff already, they can deal with these things. And they can also pursue the loopholes that allow them to, you know, get out of a lot of uh, the tax burdens that other people, frankly, just don't have access to. So, yeah, that's, that's something that should be very strong. And to your earlier point, I, I thank you for that feedback. And I do want to say, though, you know, it's, um, I like to distinguish between, you know, there's, there's knowing what side you would err on. You know, there's knowing your underlying principles that you would support. And, that, and that's what I try to do in both. Because frankly, so many of these things are very complex. So you have to distill things to a point where you say, if I'm really not sure, <laughs> I would probably vote against something that could possibly have a lot of unintended consequences and cause, you know, even more regulations and more, you know, tangled web of bureaucracy and all of these things. So, you know, you have to do that. At the same time, you have to not be afraid to enact reforms that repeal or, you know, dismantle what has been a mess. Because what happens is, once something goes into place, all of these agencies and institutions, they, they, they basically uh, latch onto it and grow, you know, their own system around it. So you, you also can't be afraid to take, um, you know, a scalpel to that and just remove it all together and start fresh. I know. I'm care right I know. Okay. <laughs> so, so. I'm just checking. <laughs> You know, one of the things that always uh, kind of frustrates me is when they talk about how effective the Congress has been. You know what the measuring stick is? <laughs> how many bills they pass. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and not how many they repeal, mm -hmm. or not how much, how much they made things better, mm -hmm. but how much stuff we threw out there. Yeah. No, it's true. Well, and, and that, and the spec can probably empathize or sympathize or whatever. <laughs> it would be that in the New Hampshire legislature, we're allowed to introduce, every member can introduce as many pieces of legislation as they want. And the $1,200 to $1,500 a bill. Yeah, but, you know, uh, more than that, this is the, the biggest issue I find, and not to get tangential here, but, you know, once you sponsor a bill, Ushering it through that process, you know, getting the language right, making sure that, you know, it actually does what you wanted it to do initially, <laughs> the initial intent, is very difficult and time consuming. And, I mean, God bless some of my legislative colleagues that can introduce 40 bills and 
that all accomplished good things and our you know reforming processes and all of that. But overall, I've always wondered if I would support a cap <laughs> on the amount of legislation one could introduce because it seems overwhelming at times, and they do just kind of go right through you know the system, and a lot of times you know there maybe wasn't the oversight that there ought to have been. Um, that it does happen. <laughs> Uh, another big problem we're having in this area is the EPA. We have two businesses that are being threatened with being shut down. Um, unlike Salem, we don't have natural gas up here. Uh, five refineries were shut down on the East Coast, so our gas, and naturally you see, the gas price is the easiest one to pick on, is, is higher. Then another problem we're having is propane. Um, because of the, of the snow and the ice across, clear across the country, uh, we can't get propane up here because all 80% of it comes by rail into New England. And that has driven the price of that. And it's even getting to the point now where it's even hard to get wood. Right now, I've, I've been in order for wood and I still haven't heard anything back on it. So I was wondering if you're going to be willing to uh, step on EPA, take a lot of that power away from Because a lot of stuff was going is that they're trying to seize property mm -hmm. and they don't have that right. They cannot come in and take your property. Yes, uh, there's no doubt that they and, frankly, many of uh, things that are very closely associated when it comes to energy initiatives, particularly in the you know, green area and all of that, they're, they're frankly quite out of bounds in so many ways and have led to so many you know, policies that are just destructive. I mean, one obvious example is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative here um, in the state. First of all, it's usually not a good sign, of course, if you're inclined the way <laughs> most of us probably are, if you're joining a, a East Coast collaboration of nine states, you know, on the East Coast in some particularly policy, in some particular policy area. But in this one, you know, being uh, energy, look, it's, it's carbon taxes, it's, you know, it's cap and trade, it's emissions. I was talking with, uh, I was at the Farm and Forestry Expo in Manchester a few weeks ago, and I was talking to some farmers from uh, north of here, and they were saying that thanks to the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, they have to, which, you know, every year they have to invest in new equipment and all that. One guy said, you know, the tractor that I've been using for so many years that I love, you know, I budgeted for, I needed to replace this on the other, I need to get an entirely new one that cost me four to five thousand dollars more. Isn't even as good, but why? Because the old version, you know, didn't meet these different uh, regulations that uh, were imposed thanks to the regional greenhouse gas initiative. I mean, that's that's unbelievable, you know. And so much of it um, is frankly just a sort of ideological and um, a policy initiative that isn't in any way, you know, related to allowing those who do care about the environment, who doesn't care, you know, more, who would care more about the environment than the people that own, you know, hundreds of acres in the state and rely on the land and the good quality of their natural resources and everything around, who would care more, you know, but yet they're the ones that are burdened by people in Washington that have no concept of this and are just following some academic study that, you know, purports to somehow save the entire world, you know, by taxing this one poor farmer in one corner of New Hampshire. So that's how things happen. It's a big problem. And again, if I were in Congress, I would really try just, you know, to be in tune with the people of New Hampshire, be in tune with what is, again, um, made this country exceptional. And that's, you know, good, good people that are responsible citizens that want to do the best, you know, for their families and their communities and live in, in this wonderful land. And I think, you know, the current administration and, frankly, popular culture and, and uh, but coming directly from the top, from our president our, himself, they're always pushing basically equality of outcome, you know, saying everybody should be the same and everybody should have the same results in life, etc. Well, this country, in my view, is all about equality of opportunity, because that's what it offers to everybody, and that's what we need to be preserving, and that's what I would try to do with my votes. We're running out of time, so I get to ask the last question. 
Nancy, Nancy Pelosi famously said about Obamacare, we have to pass it in order to find out what's in it. And I trust that you will read every bill before you vote on it. I would love to, but in that case, I heard that bill. <laughs> There's like how many pages? No, well, the problem is you can't because they're still writing it. Right? They are still writing this bill, still, yeah. years going on. They don't even know what's in it. So, yeah, I mean, it's a perfect example of what is ludicrous when, you know, foisting something across the entire country that takes one-sixth of our economy and touches, you know, our health care, which is, of course, something, nothing's more personal than that in so many ways. Um, it's, it's absurd. Thank you, Marilinda. And, um, Marie, did you pass out uh, a sign-in sheet? Um, I have it here, but if anybody didn't sign here, yeah. I'll have it everybody right over there at that table. Everybody, uh, please sign in. And, uh, and I also have a sign-up sheet here yes. if you'd like to be on the mailing list. Yeah, please do both. I'll put my sheet over there next to her sheet so yeah. anybody who didn't sign in can sign in.